All right, guys, happy March of 2020. Lots of crazy things happening in the world. The talk that I'm going to be giving today is regarding nutrition in critically ill patients. There's also a second part of this talk, which is on the title, uh, Gut Health in the Critically Ill, which I believe I'm not going to get into today for the sake of length. Um, typically, people don't hang around the YouTube videos for too long. Maybe you could pause it and watch it again at a later date. To give you all some background, my name is Eddie Joe. I'm a critical care doctor. I work in private practice. And you could follow me on Instagram or on Twitter at Eddie Joe MD. That's my handle. And my email address is listed there. Uh, I was supposed to give this lecture in Hawaii in May of this year. However, that didn't work out because of the circumstances that are going around. But I hope you get something from it. Please uh, subscribe to the channel. Leave me a thumbs up. That's honestly the way that this channel grows and that this information gets to more people. By no means am I trying to detract from my uh, dietary colleagues, my RDs who are out there, who without them um, and without their data, I wouldn't know so much. So please use, the, use those people as a point of reference if you have access to them at your institution. Um, and they can, they can definitely be a big, big help. Um, so hope you get something out of it, out of this for them. That being said, let's get started with my disclosures. I have none related to this topic. I have other disclosures, but none related to this topic. The objectives of this lecture are going to include determining the best, best methodologies for providing nutrition to the critically ill. I'm not going to dive into the immunologic realm of the gut in the critically ill. At this time, that's possibly going to be a lecture for another day. But if you guys want to see that talk, please leave me some comments down below. And the other caveat I want to say is that this, this, this data from this lecture is all as of March of 2020. If you watch this a couple of years from now, just know that the, the data might be outdated. Uh, the other thing is that I'm providing references and all the references are going to be linked below on my website at um, because ultimately don't trust what I say read the read the data for yourself and none of this is meant to be medical advice this is this is my opinion this is my lecture okay it's just just medicine so a grand uh not like a grand scheme but <clears throat> excuse me Kind of a, an idea of what we're going to be discussing is primarily the nutrition and the critically ill that's listed there. My gut health part is going to talk about the microbiome, probiotics, and fecal microbiota transplants. But the different things that we are going to discuss with regards to nutrition in the critically ill is, first of all, when to start nutrition. Should we start it early or delay it a bit? Then when we decide to provide nutrition for our patients, should we start off with trophic feeds? In other words, you know, 10 to 20 cc's per hour of whatever feed versus full nutrition for our patients. We also have a decision to make whether we're going to initiate feeds via enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition, you know, either oral or IV. We're also going to discuss nutrition in patients who are in shock because this is something that's quite important for our patients. And in the ICU, many of our patients, unfortunately, are in shock. Then we're also going to discuss protein and caloric goals, which formula to use is something that, you know, crosses our minds quite often. So we're going to look at the recommendations behind that. And then we're also going to look at approaches for patients who are of concern for refeeding syndrome. And I'll get into all that as well. Now, there are going to be numerous things that I cannot discuss because there's a very large lack of data. Okay, I wish that the nutrition data was very robust, but the truth is it's not it's not the greatest thing in the world. That's why, you know, we're looking forward to more studies coming out in the future that will help guide us. But one of the things that we do not have data for right now is to give patients either continuous or inter intermittent feeds. Now, I see why this is pretty, pretty challenging and, and it's a hot topic, but I can't discuss it because there's a school of thought which I kind of fall into which uh, basically says we're not adapted as humans from an evolutionary standpoint to receive nutrition continuously 24 hours a day. We're just not designed for that. Um, but then there's also the intermittent feed um, 
arm of the conversation where you know they basically say uh, you're not going to tolerate large volumes of two feeds etc i also can't go into organ failure subsets that's just not realistic i can't i don't have time to elaborate every single detail uh, depending on the organ failure, like for example, nepro for renal failure patients and glucerna. I mean, again, I don't want to get into all that. And then I also can't get into the feeding of certain subsets of patients, including the patients who are chronically malnourished, as well as the patients who are obese. I can't talk about that right now. And then there's also uh, uh, different arguments with regards to which type of protein to give your patients, whether it has to be soy-based protein, plant-based protein, whey protein, I, I, I can't get into that right now. That's not, there's no randomized control trial uh, testing out the types of protein, so deal with it. Now, to start off with, you know, what, what we mean by nutrition, the critical EO is that why is it so hard? Well, it's not a one size fits all type of thing. You need to take every single patient into account, uh, kind of estimate what their needs are going to be and try not to blanket it across all your patients in the ICU. That's just not going to work. There are many underlying metabolic, hormonal, and immunologic changes that occur in critical illness, which impede our ability to, you know, just feed everybody like a blanket, so to speak. And this image that's here is not, it's not uh, posted so that you can memorize it. And I'm not going to try to, excuse me, try to read every single part of this image. But we need to understand that on top of the nutritional benefits of enteral nutrition for our patients, there's also significant non-nutritional benefits like maintaining the gut flora, uh, micro and macronutrients, excuse me, micro and macronutrients, yeah, I did say it correctly. It's a, it's effect on muscle function, etc. These are all things that uh, we need to try to protect to the best of our ability. And again, all these, all these uh, articles are cited. I did not write any of these articles. So uh, to double check my work, go to eddiejoemd.com, the link down below, and you can get the citations for this. So the first question that we always ask ourselves when it comes time to take care of our patient who's critically ill is when to start the enteral nutrition, early or delayed. And we have this resource called the Aspen Guidelines that were published in 2016 that give us a good indication of what we should do for our patients. Now, the caveat to the Aspen guidelines is that even though it was published in 2016, the data that they used for the guidelines was up to the end of 2013. So the data that came out in 2014, 2015, 2016, that's going to be included in this lecture is not necessarily included in the Aspen guidelines. So keep that in mind. But what the Aspen guidelines do recommend is that we start early nutrition, starting within the first 24 to 48 hours. And they give us several reasons as to why we should go ahead and start this, which include maintaining gut integrity. It also modulates the stress and immune response, and it also attenuates disease severity. But ultimately, the quality of the evidence is very low for this. And the reason why it's very low, and I know it's hard to see uh, this forest plot, uh, ultimately the conclusion is that enteral nutrition decreases the risk of mortality by 30% with a statistically significant p-value, which ultimately, as I mentioned, favors early enteral nutrition. But when you look at the total amount of patients that are included in this, what otherwise appears to be a pretty robust forest plot, you would see that in the early arm and in the delayed arm, there are approximately 470 patients in each arm. And this is something that looks into data that, that trails back into 1979, meaning that there wasn't much data and it's not very good quality. But in addition to this, when they compared early intro nutrition versus delayed or no nutrition, they found that intro nutrition early in this case decreases the risk of infectious complications by 26%, which is uh, something worthwhile, something worth thinking about. Ultimately, about 350, 360 patients in each arm of this um, meta-analysis. But more recent data, um, 2012 is when this was published. They just looked at 28 patients. Again, guys, a small study, small study. They looked at early versus delayed intro nutrition. And what they did is that they randomized the patients to get less than, to get early intro nutrition within 24 hours of admit versus no intro nutrition for the first four days. 
And what they found is that the patients who started enteral nutrition after four days, they spent a longer time on the ventilator and they had a longer length of stay. And this was shown in a small group of patients of, of only 28 patients. So this is, this is important in my, in my book. So when you, ask, when you get asked the question of when to initiate nutrition, should it be early or delayed? The answer is pretty straightforward at this case. It's early. You start it within 24 to 48 hours of the patient being in the ICU. The next question is with regards to trophic or full nutrition. In other words, should we be giving our patients fewer calories? And this is, this is a controversial topic. That's why I'm covering it here today. And it starts off, we start learning a little bit more with regards to the EDEN trial that was published in JAMA in 2012. Again, read the study for yourself. But what they decided to do, and you can see on the table here, and my clicker doesn't actually go with it, but you can see the difference within the first five to six days of the amount of calories that the patients received between the full uh, feeding versus the trophic feeding. And they looked at a thousand patients, which is a pretty robust nutrition study. Um, and it was a randomized control trial. And what they did is that they restricted both calories and protein in this study, not just one or the other. And when they ultimately compared all these different outcomes, there was no difference. What were those outcomes? Well, ventilator-free days, organ failure-free days, uh, bacteremia, infections, etc. There was no difference between the patients who got full enteral nutrition and trophic nutrition. So keep that in mind because this is important stuff. The PERMIT trial, on the other hand, used permissive underfeeding versus standard feeding. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. They looked at about 900 patients and, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see on these tables how uh, there was a statistically significant difference in the amount of, pro of uh, calorie intake but ultimately there was no difference in the probability of survival. So when they looked at all the different outcomes, including death, uh, duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, et cetera, there was no difference between giving the patients trophic feeding versus full feeding, okay? There was a difference in the incident renal, total renal replacement therapy. Um, I really don't know what to make of that data. Possibly somebody like you, smarter than I am, could go ahead and comment down in the comment section below and you know let me know what's going on with that. Um, then they did a post hoc analysis of these thousand patients from the study and they looked at something called the Nutrix score. And for those of you who are not familiar, the Nutrix score is a calculation of somebody's nutritional status. So depending on if they're malnourished to begin with, cachectic, etc., versus somebody who uh, is robust, healthy, etc. they're going to have completely different Nutrix scores. And when they went ahead and analyzed both of these, whether they benefit from trophic feeding or, ent or full entro feeding, turned out that statistically there was no difference whatsoever between the two groups. So uh, it didn't make a difference if somebody was chronically malnourished uh, if you gave them standard feeding or permissive underfeeding. This is important stuff ultimately. Um, then in 2016, you know, they looked at, they did a meta-analysis and systematic review looking at trophic feeding versus full intro nu nutrition. And ultimately there was no difference in either mortality, whether it be ICU mortality or hospital mortality. There was no difference in nosocomial infections. There was no difference in duration of mechanical ventilation. And there was no difference in the length of stay. So ultimately no difference. But what they did find the difference for is that the lower calorie group, in other words, the patients who received trophic feeding did have less bloodstream infections and they also required less renal replacement therapy. So in the grand scheme of things that are not, that are, that had no difference, we do see that the patients who got less food, got less intro nutrition, received the trophic feeds that these patients did have some better outcomes in this meta-analysis and systematic review that was published in 2016. Then uh, there was this really cool trial. It has a cool name. It's called the EAT ICU trial. Uh, they looked at 199 patients. They should have just done 200, <laughs> but they, this was a randomized control trial, but it was in a single center. And the important thing about this study is that they used indirect calorimetry as well as a 24 hour urine urea excretion to see what the nutritional status of these patients was. 
And I say that this is important because many of our facilities, I mean, I know I've never worked in a facility that has indirect calorimetry before, but they had all the fancy tools to try to find a difference in these patients. And what they, what they tried to do was give the early goal directed nutrition group, both parental and uh, intro nutrition to help them get to their, help them get to their goals and help them get more calories versus the standard of care group, was, which was just uh, basically trickle feeds, so to speak. And so again, they looked at 200 patients in this group and using, you know, again, one group had full nutrition that was comprised of uh, intro nutrition and TPN. And then the other group just had trickle feeds and there was no difference in the outcomes, no difference in either benefit nor harm when it comes to length of stay, uh, uh, mortality and other, other outcomes that they measured, no difference. So basically, when we look at, when we have the question in front of us of whether we should give patients trophic versus full nutrition, should we be giving patients fewer calories? This data that I presented here suggests that it appears as if trophic feeds are better than full intro nutrition. So keep that in mind when you wanna, you know, be aggressive and start giving people uh, pureed cheeseburgers, so to speak, obviously that's a joke, don't do that, <clears throat> excuse me but it appears as if trophic fees is the way to go for these patients. Now, this is a, <laughs> this is a controversial one. Again, everything, I, everything I'm covering is controversial for a reason, because you can see where the data is all over the place. Um, looking at intro versus parental nutrition, and does the route really matter? Okay, um, I know that right now everybody's, you know, flaring up because I'm talking about parental nutrition and we all have this, um, preconceived notion of parental nutrition, in other words, TPN, causing increased infections and a whole bunch of litany of other issues, including increased expense. Let's kind of put the expense to the back of our minds a little bit in this topic, but let's just look at the data. Does the route really matter? And we have to go back to 2014, the calories trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at about 2,400 patients, randomized control trial, and they randomized the patients to get either intro nutrition or parental nutrition within 36, 36 hours, and they continued giving the patients this regimen for five days. Ultimately, as you can tell by this table that's listed here, um, they really didn't have a significant difference between the two. Although the parental, the parental nutrition group did seem to get a little bit more calories every single day, and that might have to do with the fact of you know people checking for residuals, uh, procedures, things of that nature that usually aren't stopped when um, people are getting parental nutrition. Nonetheless, randomizing people between getting parental nutrition and intro nutrition, there was no difference in mortality. And as well, there was no difference in infectious complications. This is important to keep in mind because we all think that TPN causes an increase in infectious complications, but this data that was from 2014, still recent, shows that there's no increase in infectious complications. We have gotten significantly better as a healthcare system worldwide at making sure that these pick lines and these central lines stay clean and sterile and you know people don't get infections from them. So I thought that was pretty cool. Ultimately, what the Aspen guidelines say, um, and again, this is looking back at the data from 2013, okay? so. This is why they didn't take into account this, uh, this calories trial. When they had data of only 250 patients in each arm, 500 patients in total, they thought that intro nutrition decreased um, infectious complications. So when you look at the Aspen guidelines, you know, they're, they're kind of like hesitant to push away from parental nutrition, but this is why you gotta keep reading guys, because when you look at the more recent data, like the calories trial, you find out that there really isn't a difference in infectious complications. So when, you, when you're asked the question, intro versus parental nutrition, does the route really matter? Well, definitely intro nutrition is preferable um, because it's cheaper, you know, it, it's, not as, uh, it's not as demanding on the pharmacy staff and the nutrition, the, the registered dietitians to, you know, cook up a good concoction for the patients, et cetera. You know, patients don't need a central line necessarily for intro nutrition because obviously you're, you're feeding the gut. Um, but it appears not to matter with regards to outcomes, whether somebody gets intro or parental nutrition, which is always good for our patients. Now, 
What if early internutrition, in other words, 24 to 48 hours is contraindicated? Should you start parenteral nutrition in, in these patients? And when they looked at the studies that started off in 2013, and obviously there were studies before then, this is just you know things that are relevant. They looked at about 1,400 patients in this study, multi-centered, which were mostly in Australia and New Zealand. And um, what they tried was standard care of nutrition, which is enteral or parental nutrition started at approximately three days in versus early parenteral nutrition, which means 44 minutes after enrollment. I don't know how these people did such a great job of, <laughs> of starting parental nutrition 44 minutes after enrollment. Uh, when you look at the vitamins trial that, you know, they, they enrolled the patients and 12 hours later is when they got their first drug. TPN is a lot harder to give than vitamin C and it's a lot harder to cook up for the pharmacy staff. But I, I digress entirely. This is not, <clears throat> this is not about the vitamins trial, excuse me, as I clear my throat. But when they looked at, um, you know, standard care versus early parental nutrition, there was no difference in mortality for these patients. So there was no benefit outcome in that. But they did find that the patients who were on early parental nutrition got off the day faster. And you might look at a statistically significant p-value and think, okay, we might be onto something here. It gets people off the vent faster, so therefore the cost benefit might be worthwhile to use early parental nutrition. I can see how that argument is made. But when you read the fine print, and this is why you, know, you actually have to read the article, the difference in the time that the patients were on the ventilator was about half a day. So, and they were on the vent for about a week. So when you count TPN for seven days, the cost of that is not equivalent. It still ends up being more expensive than, uh, than doing the early enteral nutrition. And, you know, half a day is not, is not something that I would, you know, start TPN on my patients for. Um, the other important thing, and it goes back to what I mentioned previously, is that there was no increase in infections in patients who received parenteral nutrition. So that whole concept of parenteral nutrition causing an increase in infections kind of needs to get out of our heads. We need to start not worrying about that as much. In other words, we still need to take good care of patient central lines and such, but we don't, we don't have to be as paranoid as we once were. We've gotten better at this. So... Answering the question of what if early enteral nutrition is contraindicated, should you start parenteral nutrition instead? Well, in my opinion, it may not be worth the financial expense to get the patient off half a day uh, sooner. Now, if you do have to start parenteral nutrition, when should we start it? That's, that's the next hard question to answer. And then we have the, the EPANIC trial, these people come up with some cool names. This was from 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they looked at almost 4,700 patients, 4,640 patients to be exact. And this was a randomized control trial where they gave patients a supplemental parental nutrition, either on day one versus day eight. And they found that the patients who had the parental nutrition initiated earlier, in other words, in day one, they didn't do better than the patients who got it on day eight. The people who had early initiation, they, few of them were discharged alive. They also had a longer length of stay. In this particular study, they did show that they had more infections. They also had more inflammation. And that whole benefit of getting patients off the vent faster was not seen in this trial. They spent a longer time on the vent. And therefore, you know, they also had other factors that uh, were not favorable for the patient, which included more renal failure, uh, longer hospital length of stay, and ultimately it costs more money because starting parental nutrition on day one versus day eight is uh, the cost of one, one day of TPN times seven. You know, it all, it all ends up becoming more costly. So, you know, it's not, it's not, it wasn't something beneficial to start parental nutrition early on these patients. So then with the recommendation of the American Thoracic Society, as well as the ACCP, as one of their choosing widely, choosing wisely, excuse me, guidelines state that in patients who are adequately nourished, in other words, patients who are robust, not patients who are cachectic, okay, they recommend not using parenteral nutrition within the first seven days. So hold your horses on giving parenteral nutrition. It, it is deemed to have been associated with harm or at best no benefit in terms of survival or ICU length of stay. So 
Don't get trigger happy to start TPN on these patients. Wait a little bit. There's no benefit to doing it. Um, also, it's associated with, with uh, unnecessary costs. Now, in your patients who are malnourished, however, you should consider it because they may be benefit from early parental nutrition. That's why you can't just blanket every patient. Uh, you need to think about this for every patient as an individual. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, ultimately, when should we start it? Day seven in non-malnourished patients. That's when we should start it. Now, patients who are in shock, should we give these patients trickle feeds or full enteral nutrition? Good question, good question. Uh, I definitely recommend that you check out the work by Paul Wishmeyer, who's a critical care doctor who's working at Duke right now. At the time of this, uh, he has a pretty popular social media account on Instagram and Twitter, but he writes a lot of stuff on nutrition. He's somebody who I look up to um, a lot <laughs> because he, he puts out good work. But why are we even worried about um, you know, giving patients nutrition who are on vasopressors? But there's always a concern of mesenteric ischemia as well as non-occlusive bowel necrosis. Now, we should not initiate enteral nutrition in patients who are not hemodynamically stable and patients who are actually deteriorating. If you have uncontrolled hypotension, in other words, you haven't gotten your vasopressors in order, um, you, should not, you should not start enteral nutrition on these patients. Also, if you find that you're going up on your vasopressor doses rather than down, it might not be very intelligent to start enteral nutrition on these patients. So you should really should not start it. No way to take out steam out of a out of a lecture like having technical difficulties, but it is what it is. Um, digging digging back into the lecture, certain things that you need to watch out for if you do decide to initiate early intro nutrition on a patient who's in shock. Aside from the things I mentioned previously, include increased abdominal distension, and you you have to examine your patients. That's that's how it goes. You know, if the patient is more distended. They have decreased bowel sounds. They're not having bowel movements and they're not passing gas, you need to really watch out for that. Um, you also need to see if they have a worsening metabolic acidosis. That could be letting you know that the patient's having some sort of gut ischemia underneath. Also, periodically, and I'm not a huge fan of checking uh, gastric residual volumes, but sometimes you need to check it if the patient's becoming unstable, as well as see what their NG tube output is. Now, um, Looking at the Nutria study, which was <laughs> a name that has a, excuse me, a study that has a funny name, but I got it down, Nutria. I'm not going to fumble it this time. This was a study published in 2017. In other words, it's a really recent study, which is a randomized control trial where they used early enteral versus early parenteral uh, nutrition in shock. So one group got two feeds enterally. The other group received uh, parenteral nutrition. They looked at approximately 2,400 patients, all were intubated, all of them were on vasopressors, and more than 90% of the patients were in the medical ICU. And the, and the nutritional regimen that they used was 20 to 25 kilocals per kilogram per day. In other words, they got, they got a good amount of nutrition. Okay, and ultimately there was no difference in mortality, length of stay, ventilator days, or vasopressors which you might say, okay, cool. So in other words, let's go ahead and start people on um, early intro nutrition at 20 to 25 kilocals per kilogram per day. And there ultimately wasn't an increase in infections, whether they're central end infections or ICU acquired infections between the two groups. Yet another study showing that parental nutrition does not cause as many infections as we once thought. But here's the kicker guys, and this is the information that you need to take away from the study which include the gastrointestinal complications that were noted in this study from enteral nutrition. Those complications include vomiting, diarrhea, bowel ischemia, and acute colonic pseudo-obstruction. And you would see that even though the incidence isn't too high in, for example, for bowel ischemia, this was still statistically significant. And ultimately you need to think about more GI complications with giving this much enteral nutrition. Now, Moving on to the TARGET study, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2018, they looked at approximately 4,000 patients in this study. More than 80% of these patients were on vasopressors, and they were started on intranutrition, whether it was close to 2,000 uh, 
calories versus 1400 calories, they started within 16 hours of being admitted to the ICU. And on this table that is, that is shown here, you can see that uh, there was a difference between the two groups and how much nutrition they got. But ultimately, whether they got 1900 kilocals or 1400 kilocals, there was no difference in the outcome, which showed no difference in benefit nor harm. Whether we're talking about death, uh, we're talking about adverse events, things of that nature. And then they did, you know, since they had a study that, again, how many people had? 4,000 people. Again, we're looking at different studies <laughs> that have come out recently compared to the studies when the, when the Aspen guidelines were published in 2016. Again, this this study had 4,000 people on it. It's pretty robust. I really got to tip my hat to the people who created it. But they did a subgroup analysis, and they looked at different things uh, based on the age, trauma, sepsis, BMI, to see if there was a difference in the outcomes. But honestly, there was no difference in any of the outcomes, even after a very thorough subgroup analysis. Something to keep in mind. So when you have your patients who are in shock, should you give them trickle feeds, I know I wrote a lot of different parameters here. Or full enteral nutrition, when they are in shock, trickle feeds will be just fine. You don't need to go overboard with giving patients nutrition here. Something to keep in mind. Now, what about protein? And I put my little three little muscles there because, you know, protein is important for muscles. I misspoke. I know it's not muscles. Okay, give me a break. So what do the Aspen guidelines recommend? Uh, protein requirements between 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram per day of actual body weight. And a lot of things in critical care, we talk about ideal body weight. But here we talk about actual body weight. Burn and trauma patients may need more protein. So keep that in mind. The quality of the evidence for this is very low and is based on observational studies. The type of protein, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, is unknown at this time. And then, so you gotta give patients protein. And one of the things that I'm noticing when I'm catching up on the new trends on what's going on is that there's there's a lot of enthusiasm about the, about how much protein we should be giving our patients. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of this. I love giving my patients supplemental protein when I have a chance. And uh, that's in my practice, not a, not a recommendation for you all. Um, but seeing that the data is kind of heading in that direction is something that's, that's important to me. So which formulation should we use? Because ultimately there, there's so many options. I mean, every, every pharma company has a couple different options. Um, what Aspen recommends is to use a uh, standard polymeric formula. And what I do in my practice is this is where I reach out to people who know more than I do and I ask for help. I ask, I ask them for a recommendation, which one should we give our patients? So. That's what you should probably do as well. Now, let's look at calorie goals and how much we should be feeding our patients because this is, this is important as well. Now, if, if you're in a facility that has indirect calorimetry, you should go ahead and use it. This is what's recommended by the Aspen guidelines. But for example, I don't have access to that. At least I don't think I have access for that. But what you should use in these cases is 25 to 30 kilocals per kilogram per day. That's the recommended uh, dose or the recommended amount of calories you should give these patients. Now, refeeding syndrome. When you have somebody who's in refeeding syndrome, should you restrict or continue, continue normal caloric intake? And I'm starting to get tired. Um, there was a study that was published by Doing. I have a funny, funny name for this gentleman. Sorry, don't mean to make fun. But uh, they did a trial where they did restricted versus continued, continued standard caloric intake during the management of refeeding syndrome. They looked at 330 patients. This was published in uh, one of the Lancet subset journals in 2015. And what they found, and you know, on the left table, it has the mean caloric intake, uh, which you can see the difference between the standard group and the patients who got, uh, who got stricter calories, is that on the right-hand side, you can see that their survival in the patients who got fewer calories was much, much better. It was statistically significant. So if you have somebody who's in refeeding syndrome, don't try to give them all the cheeseburgers pureed at once. Feed them little by little. So you should restrict the calories on these patients. How much exactly? Every patient is different, okay? So I leave this up to you and your clinical judgment and the clinical judgment of your multidisciplinary team. So continuing on, uh, just a couple tables which are not meant for you to be able to read on your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you're 
looking at this video on which by the way thanks for sticking sticking around so long and please leave me a thumbs up if you learned absolutely anything from this video but this was published earlier this year in critical care which is one of the free journals so therefore i like to promote their stuff because i like free stuff just like you probably like free stuff uh free good quality stuff for that matter but they go ahead and they they differentiate the patients between those who are well nourished or moderately malnourished versus those who are severely malnourished and they provide recommendations in different phases of their stay in the icu whether it be the early acute phase the acute late phase or and i covered this up or the recovery phase. Obviously, I'm not too, too, too familiar. I didn't memorize this um, this table because it's easy to access. It's one of those things that um, I keep saved on my phone. So um, there's also this, this school of thought, and I saved this for last because this is possibly the, the largest controversy comes from this. But there are people who are in school of thought that we should not be feeding our critically ill patients um, at all. And there's not much data to support this, but from a physiologic perspective, it kind of makes sense. And I don't do this in my patients right now. I'm trying to wait for more evidence. But what I mean is that there's something called sickness associated anorexia. And we've all lived through this at some point or another in our own personal lives. And what I mean by that is, you know, you get the flu or you get a cold or you get uh, food poisoning or something and your body takes away your whole appetite. And there's a school of thought that says that patients who are septic shock, they don't eat because they're delaying, they're, they have an elevate, elevated catabolic tone and therefore the body is trying to preserve itself by not eating. And so that's just something to keep in mind that we might see data on in the future. And if you know anything of this topic and you'd like to share, I'd love to see it. Um, but I think that's, that's the talk. Um, geez, I took a long time to go through all this. Either way, there's a whole other section on gut health, um, which are where I discuss the microbiome, probiotics, and fecal microbiota transplant, which let me know down in the comments below if you'd like to see it. That, that concludes my talk. Please leave me questions below. I, I'm, trying really hard to, um, I'm trying really hard to respond to everybody's comments, but honestly, it takes a lot of time. I, I'm grateful for my support that I receive from everybody here on YouTube, on social media, as I just struck my table. Um, but thank you all for your help. Please leave me a thumbs up if you learned absolutely anything in this talk. And it'll give me encouragement to go ahead and put out my other talks as well. Thank you very much and have a great day.